option. So if you're a student and you're not yet in our program, come talk to um, either Susan or myself after the presentation. Um, Kelly's doing her doctorate at OISE UT in the Adult Education and Community Development Program. Uh, she has more than 25 years of health systems expertise, including direct practice, education, health policy, and health administration at the local, provincial, and national level. Um, Kelly has a proven track record in leading regional collaborative initiatives in the areas of health system planning and design, geriatrics, and primary care. She's currently the Executive Director of Provincial Geriatrics Leadership Ontario and is the past Executive Director at Seniors Care Network, which is a coordinating entity for all specialized geriatric services in the Central East Region of Ontario. It was formerly known as the Regional Specialized Geriatric Services. Kelly is also an adjunct professor in the Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Ontario Institute of Technology, and she's an interdisciplinary fellow with the Canadian Frailty Network. Her research interests include health systems design and collaboration with seniors and the use of and limits of technology in the care of frail older adults. And we're really looking forward today to her talk, which is entitled, Listening for Change, the use of institutional ethnography and the listening guide to understand the experiences and challenges of aging at home. So thanks so much, Kelly, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And it's a delight to see so many uh, colleagues of mine who I gave very short notice to of this presentation because I was feeling a little nervous. So it's a delight to see you here. And for those I haven't met yet, uh, also a pleasure to have the chance to talk with you about this work. So I, I'm going to follow a fairly routine uh, path, uh, but uh, meander a little bit through that. One note I'd like to make is that you'll note that my uh, presentation uh, title slide said that I was a PhD candidate. So this presentation reflects work in progress, including findings and reflections to date. So feel free to use the chat as I'm talking. If things are occurring to you, I'd love to see your feedback. And of course, your feedback is most welcome. I understand an evaluation will be posted in as a link into the chat at one point and certainly will appreciate hearing from you. So let me dive in and, and set the stage for you. So the background to this work really starts with uh, the context of aging in Ontario. And in Canada, most older adults over the age of 65 live in private dwellings and only about 6.8% live in congregate settings. And so right off the top, I'd like to dispel the myth that older adults move into long-term care as they age. Most older adults want to remain living in their homes. And in some places in the literature, this is referred to as aging in place. And there's, uh, you'll notice that the title of my presentation referred to aging at home. Sometimes those are used interchangeably. The likelihood of moving to a long-term care home increases with the presence of frailty. And I've just sort of highlighted that word because I know it is a contested term and I'll speak about that in a moment, but let me introduce it first to you in the way it's usually used. So frailty is a medical term used to describe older adults living with multiple and interacting health problems, and sometimes we call that complexity, who are more susceptible to declining health if they experience relatively minor illness. Uh, we know, and, and the organization that I work for has done some work to estimate that there'll be about uh, 900,000 people over the age of 65 who will, can be expected to be living with frailty by about 2030. And this may change uh, because of the impact of the recent pandemic and the current and ongoing pandemic. So supporting people living with frailty to age in place requires the availability of a number of, and a quite a variety of enablers, including services and supports. And I'm gonna really focus in on that. Well, let me just start off with the entry point. What brings me to this work? Um, I'm certainly, I'm the daughter of aging parents, one of whom I've lost recently in June. Um, I'm also a health administrator and I've been doing that work since 1998. Um, and I'm a mature learner returning to graduate studies part-time uh, and combining that with a full-time with full-time work. So I've got about 30 years of experience working at all levels of healthcare. And I'm a non-sociologist. I, I, my my uh, master's degree is in health leadership. Uh, and so I'm attempting to make use of sociological methods, which were new to me when I began this journey. 
Right now, I work, as my introduction indicated, as an executive engaged in health service planning, design, and delivery for older adults living with complex health conditions. And that's where the word frailty kind of crops up in my everyday work. But I wanted to just let you know more, more intimately how I came to take on this, this uh, you know, to come back to school and um, undertake uh, PhD studies. And, and the, there were some unsettling observations that I noticed as I was uh, going about my everyday in my career. First was a policy disconnect. Most of my career has been spent working with older adults in some capacity. And, and around, I noticed in probably in the last 15 years, a policy disconnect where we were talking on the one hand at a policy level about supporting people to age at home. And on the other hand, uh, older adults were reporting that that was increasingly difficult to do. And so I kind of began to wonder about that. What is wrong with the system? What's going on? How is it that we say one thing and another thing happens? I also had an experience that was quite powerful for me and it really reinforced for me the power of administrative in instruments. And one of the instruments that, that sort of stuck in my mind was a funding letter. And this experience uh, really um, revolved around new policy that was uh, coming from the Ministry of Health that was directing um, uh, new funding towards uh, dementia care and adult day programming. And the, uh, the, this was communicated via a letter that was received by local health authorities called Lo um, Local Health Integration Networks at the time. And when the letter was received, there was sort of a policy uh, flurry of activity to try to think of the best way to utilize this funding. And I was working in an organization at that time that provided policy advice and happened to note um, that there was a gap in service for people who were living with dementia but were younger the, than the age of 65. And so uh, our group, uh, our team developed some policy advice that we submitted that suggested that some of the new funding should be directed to serve this gap. And the answer we got back was puzzling. It, it, the answer that we got back was, well, that's not what the letter says. The letter says this, it doesn't make any reference to people with young onset dementia. And so therefore it's not allowed. And, and thank you for your advice, but no thank you. And that didn't satisfy me. So of course I traced back a little farther and found um, the ministry person that had issued the letter and asked the question, you know, would, would this be an acceptable use of the funds? Uh, and that, um, that person uh, supplied me with an email that was um, able to convince the policymakers that indeed we should consider providing some of that funding to young onset people. And in the end, that policy advice was accepted and we were able to create programming for, uh, for people living with dementia younger than the age of 65. And I sort of sat back and thought, wow, if, if um, myself and my team weren't there to advocate and to, to follow this up, and, and if, that, um, if there hadn't been an email that kind of overruled the first letter, uh, what would have happened? And I began to sort of see that these texts had, had some meaning. I also noticed uh, something about the use of personal stories. There was in increasing interest in trying to take on some of the, uh, the work that was coming out of the UK around co-design where, where the experiences of individuals are sort of taken up and used in, in trying to shape the healthcare system. And I was observing that um, patients were increasingly being invited to attend board meetings um, of how at the health system level and share their experiences via by via personal story, usually at the beginning of a meeting. And what I noticed happening was that the um, the story would be told, people would empathize, and the meeting would go on. The agenda wasn't changed. There was really nothing done with those stories. And interesting, um, what I'm hearing now, uh, more recently, is some resistance from health leaders to anecdotes, uh, the, the stories being termed as anecdotes, uh, and they're not seen as useful evidence. Unfortunately, from an older adult perspective, a lot of times there, there isn't quantitative data that reflects their situation, and so this is troubling. And finally, I, I've sort of settled on this word frailty a couple of times, and I began to notice that there were two discourses of frailty that at times were at odds with each other. One, one way that frailty was being used was really this clinical conceptual frame that I was used to. 
And that um, really involved assessment of health and social problems of an individual, usually by a team of health professionals. And the intention here was to uncover issues that uh, needed to be addressed and could be addressed through interventions and treatments that were known to work for an older adult population. Uh, sometimes treatments and interventions are applied to an older adult's body that don't actually work well for them. And, and on the other hand, um, there, there's this emerging planning conceptual frame uh, that's, that's uh, being undertaken now as, we're th as the health system is transforming. And this is seeing the stratification of populations into groups, groups now called groups of frail people, uh, where pathways of care are being designed um, for, uh, for the problems that they're experiencing as a population. At some, in some cases, this also can cause the restriction of access to services uh, such as critical care for people who score at a particular level of frailty and particularly when resources are scarce, such as the recent pandemic. So I began to kind of see some, some challenges with this discourse of frailty. On the one hand, this discursive production of frailty and frail people, and on the other hand, a dis discourse-driven service design. So with all of that in mind, I came to this study where I wanted to understand uh, two things. I wanted to identify institutional processes in the Ontario healthcare system that coordinate the experiences of older people who are trying to live out their lives at home. And I also wanted to adapt and model research tools that health leaders can use to improve the analysis of institutional coordination that affects older people who live with advanced age and complex health conditions. And my interest here was in helping health leaders to drive health system change. So that's how I started out. I'm gonna introduce you now to a concept that uh, comes from, or is, is quite relevant in institutional ethnography, the main method that I used. And it's the, the, the um, concept of standpoint. Uh, standpoint refers to experience rather than perspective. So it's not what a person thinks, but what a person experiences. And Dorothy Smith, the creator of institutional ethnography, notes that this allows an inquiry to move from everyday experiences to explicate organizational administrative and administrative practices. Bonnie Burso adds to this, and a great quote from uh, one of her pieces of uh, one of her works is, it, it is not, that is, what the person experiencing this disjuncture believes, and disjuncture is another term I'll explain in a moment, but what can be seen by standing in their position while on the alert for traces of institutional rule. And so keeping that in mind, I, I um, want to just make a distinction between standpoint versus perspective, because when I began this work, I thought I was dealing with two standpoints, the standpoints of older adult, the standpoint of older adults and caregivers, and a standpoint of health leaders. But I actually came to realize that, in fact, there was really only one standpoint that um, I, I, would, I would work from, and that was the standpoint of older adults and caregivers whose subject position and local everyday bodily experience is problematized by the options that, that are available for them when they need support. And this is often referred to as, as, as looking or taking um, the, the standpoint of those who are being ruled by the regime of ruling or by the apparatus that sort of coordinates their experience. The distinction is the perspective. So I'm the, I also have the perspective of a health leader who's complicit in organizing the local and the extra local institutions of healthcare and activating the texts, kind of like that funding letter I mentioned earlier that coordinate the lives of older people and may limit their choices. And so that perspective is also important, uh, but it is not standpoint. Another concept in institutional eth ethnography is the idea of a problematic. And I struggled a little bit with the definition here of what that means uh, and eventually found some great explanations from Campbell and Gregor and Basilium. A problematic is really a series of puzzles, tensions and experiences that result from how society is organized. So it's not a problem, uh, it is bigger than that. And so I began with an initial question of how does it happen that older people who intended to live out their lives at home end up institutionalized? And the problematic I eventually, and, and you never really sort of get to the problematic until you dive into to the study itself, 
But what I realized I was beginning to uncover was a problematic of an Ontario healthcare system that's not designed for older adults. And this is a growing population uh, cohort that really must be served better. And so this, this perspective that I held as a health leader, um, the rigor of institutional ethnography really demanded that I take on an attitude of reflexivity as I set out in this work. And I was concerned about my perspective and this, this idea that I might risk institutional capture. Dorothy Smith describes institutional capture as um, sort of putting, um, listening to the experiences of people uh, through the lens of institutional language and uh, institutional concepts and starting to slot their experience into those, uh, those preconceived notions. A good example of that is when somebody says to you, the lady who, who organized or who told me that I needed to move to long-term care, and in my mind, I would translate that into care coordinator, uh, bringing in institutional language. Um, and really, I, I really needed to stay within the words that the uh, older adult was using because the fact that she didn't know the lady's name was quite relevant given it was an important decision. So that's just an example of when you're listening to someone, you can start to translate what they're saying into your institutional language and that's called institutional capture. So I went about um, drawing on some work from Findlay and others to think about how I could hold some ideas in my mind that would help me be reflexive as I went through this work, questioning assumptions, um, developing uh, you know, a, a vision around connections and relationships, really attending to power relationships, feelings and thoughts. And I used discomfort, I've highlighted it there because I used discomfort quite a bit as a, as a something that uh, made, gave me pause and, and helped me recognize when I might need to dig a little bit deeper. Uh, I also sought a research design that would specifically help me foster reflexivity. And I was intentional about wanting to avoid analytic methods that seem, because I'd really wit witnessed the accounts being told by older adults disappear into generic and, and sometimes meaningless themes uh, in management and, and uh, the, you know, the kinds of positions that I've held for many years. We often do consultations with, with groups and um, as part of those consultations, you'll come away with notes that you'll turn into themes and sometimes the meaning is lost. And I, I noticed that happening quite a lot in, in the older adult experience. So I'll talk a little bit about the methods and approach. I'm gonna spend a bit of time here because that was sort of the genesis of this particular presentation. Um, so I've mentioned already, I've kind of foreshadowed uh, this part of the presentation by talking about institutional ethnography. So that was the main method. And I used an institutional ethnography adaptation of something called the listening guide. And I'll get into that a little bit more. I used interviews and I, as well, I used an institutional ethnography informed literature uh, review approach. And the ordering that I have uh, listed here is intentional. In institutional ethnography, you don't necessarily do a literature review first. And in fact, I did not do that. I did my interviews first. And part of the reason why you don't do your literature first is, is so that you don't bring um, uh, concepts and ideas from the literature into the work of your tracing and your analysis of the interviews and, and the experiences of the people that you're working with or, or whose standpoint, standpoint you're trying to, to work from. So uh, just to give you a quick um, caps capsule of uh, the approach, I, I had 11 participants. Uh, they were, six of them were between the ages of, of 75 and 101, and 101, and one of those people in that age group was a caregiver. Uh, another four participants were caregivers of people. Uh, they, they themselves were aged between 50 and 75 years, but the people that they cared for were older than 75, and that was one of my uh, criteria for recruitment. Um, and the particip one participant was younger than 50. And so I, uh, the standpoint uh, I had sort of reflected it in my earlier slide is older adults and caregivers or care partners. And you can see how that breaks down. So six people spoke on their own behalf and they self-identified that they lived with health problems and were finding managing aspects of their everyday life increasingly difficult. And five participants spoke on behalf of the others who were over the age of 75 and had multiple health problems requiring assistance with their daily activities. And I did not collect any other um, demographic information, did not get into detail about what their health conditions were. 
So institutional ethnography, just a little, and I won't do justice to the richness of this method in, in a single slide, uh, but it's a methodology created by Dorothy Smith. And, 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 uh, and this uh, Campbell and, McG and, and Gregor uh, do a good job in sort of um, uh, defining this further. Uh, they describe it as a theorized way of seeing and knowing that reorientates people in their everyday world. So essentially, it's a me method of inquiry that starts with what is called a disjuncture. And you see this word again, this is kind of a rupture or a contradiction in everyday life. And, and the contradiction I was sort of thinking about was this, I would like to live at home, I'm not able to live at home. Uh, and, and it orientates the, research, the researcher to investigate the discursive and institutional processes that reproduce this, this kind of disjuncture. And I'll show you a couple of examples in a moment. This method relies on the examination of texts and how texts are coordinated or textual coordination. And it also informs the data collection and analytic processes. The listening guide, which I also used, uh, was created by Brown and Gillian in 1993 as part of a project out of Harvard that was uh, looking at, uh, the, at the experiences of girls and women. It was further developed by Mausner and Doucette, and they expanded the focus on relationships and the broader social structure, structural and cultural context within which they live. Walby, in 23 suggested that this is a helpful tool for institutional ethnography. And he argued that um, there's four, four phases in the listening guide. He argued that the first two steps of the listening guide focus on standpoint, which I introduced earlier, and the latter to enable reading for the texts and textual coordination. This was further picked up by Reed in 2009 and refined for IE. And so this sort of satisfied what I was concerned about. There was a, I, I was feeling there was an analytic gap in institutional ethnography. And I, I, I was not confident that I had enough experience to be able to uh, conduct an institutional ethnography without specific procedures for conducting the analysis. And fortunately, uh, the listening guide is consistent with IE's focus on the individual's experience and, and shares underpinnings in feminist theory. So here's what I did. Um, so on the left-hand side are the listening tasks. Essentially what you're doing with the listening guide is you take your transcripts and you read them four times in a rigorous way. Uh, the left-hand side of the listening tasks that are described by Walby and Reed. And I added a little bit of, of, of additional focus in each stage so that I was teasing out specific things that I wanted to, to make sure I, I examined. So the, in the first reading, you're reading for the plot, the story, the actors. Uh, I was also interested in things that were difficult, events um, and, and personal reaction. In the second stage, you're reading for the voice of I uh, and you're taking out uh, sections of text that actually um, begin with the, the word I and have some uh, following text. And you'll see that in a moment. Uh, I was also interested too in the visibility of the work people were doing to stay at home. In the third uh, phase, you're listening for something called contrapuntal voices. I love that word. Uh, and this is sort of taken to mean social networks, broader relations, and Walby and Reed suggest also textually mediated relations. And I also wanted to look in this reading for clues about the text, extra local coordination, that's coordination that happens often out of sight of the person being impacted. And I, and I sort of, um, uh, Ex uh, found myself with some and un unanswered questions as well. And finally, the listening, the final listening task, when you read the fourth time, you're looking for the cultural context, discourses, social structures and forces. And my, because I have a, um, some uh, historical underpinnings in gerontology, uh, I also wanted to understand the impact of the frailty discourse and social construction of age and ageism, including where I could see ageist thinking being taken up by older adults. Uh, this is just a just to um, peel back the curtain a little bit. I always like to know how, exactly how things are done. Uh, so this is just a quick example where I uh, this is what my um, 
uh, Excel spreadsheet looks like. And, you know, I just have the, the uh, text in the middle from my, my um, transcripts. And then I have these four columns on the right hand side. And I was sort of flagging parts of the text as I went through and read that were relevant to each reading. So you can, you can see how I kind of pulled things out. I later learned uh, a method of doing this in, in vivo. So for anyone who wants to follow that, uh, that uh, logistical trail, I'm happy to have another conversation. So I wanted just to reinforce that these were sort of um, complementary methods. And I think um, there is a little tension in the institutional ethnography world about whether or not you can combine institutional ethnography with other things. I feel that you can, and I think uh, both Walby and Reed make a good argument uh, for combining institutional ethnography with the listening guide. For me, I used um, this IE frame to, um, to conduct my literature review heavily influenced by the work of Dahmer. And I also used it to design the uh, approach to interviewing as well as my data analysis, which was also informed by the work of Rankin. The listening guide com complemented this and it really helped me to avoid institutional capture. And I can give you a good example. Uh, when I sat down to rigorously read through the four readings of the listening guide, I realized how much I did not hear people when I was in the moment with them during the interview. And I was really, um, and how much I missed some of the things they were saying. So I had a lot of discoveries during that process. Uh, and uh, I think uh, I can really attest to the fact that having that rigor was important, especially for someone like me who's been so long working in healthcare. So it did facilitate my hearing. It also facilitate my hearing of different voices, which I would have missed if I didn't have a structured process. And it did help me to identify text. So I can give you a bit of a picture of what that looks like. So I'm gonna move now to some of the findings. Um, still, these are emerging and, uh, and I'll walk you through some of what I've discovered so far. So I began sort of focusing in on everyday activities and noticing things that surprised me. And this is sort of advice as well that, that um, Jill, uh, Gilly, uh, <laughs> Gilligan and Eddie also uh, offer. Uh, they, they use the word things that wow you too. And these may seem rather mundane, but I'll give them to you as examples. So the first is an example that I'm gonna dive into a little bit deeper. And it was when one of my participants said, for, for instance, they couldn't do my laundry, they could do his laundry. So you have to keep two laundry baskets, right? Uh, the second is, a, and, I'll, and I'm gonna pick on that one a little bit further in a moment. The second is uh, a statement that one of the participants made where they said, we began to experience incontinence. And when I heard that, I thought, what do you mean we? Uh, isn't that a personal problem? How is it we? And I couldn't really understand why, why the participant was saying we uh, until I, I, I sort of reflected on it and realized the impact of her husband's incontinence on her and the work that she did in order to support him. And I really began to see that the use of the pronoun we was quite appropriate, but it didn't influence the way services were allocated to them as a couple. The services were still aligned to his needs, not hers. The next one was sort of interesting to me and it, and it really, um, I, it was only because of my insider knowledge that I spotted this one. In this case, the person's identifying that they weren't getting very much help until they went to an outpatient geriatric clinic. And they said that the doctor provided them with an extra six hours of home care. They had eight, but now they had 14. Well, I knew that the doctor was not responsible for allocating home care. So that was actually somebody else's role within the healthcare system. So how is it that um, this person had this experience of a doctor influencing their home care hours? And, uh, and what occurred to me is that there was some manner of coordination happening either through evidence that the doctor produced back to the, uh, the home care agency or, um, or a phone call that they would have made uh, that, um, that had the impact of coordinating what this individual was receiving in terms of hours of support. And the last one I'll also um, get into in a little bit more detail. Um, uh, the quote is that he spent four months in hospital after they moved him out of hospital. Uh, and when they moved him to long-term care, they said, you will be moved as soon as there's a room. And we'll look at this one in a little bit more detail. 
Um, one of the other things that sort of comes out of doing using the listening guide is the creation of these eye poems. So I mentioned pulling out some of the text and, and there are some cautions associated with pulling out text, um, but it's done in a very particular way where you actually look at all of the places in the transcript where the person speaks in the voice of I, and you isolate some of that, that uh, so you isolate those instances with a little bit of explanatory text along with it and, and create a bit of a literature, literary um, artifact uh, that uh, some of the, the authors that uh, I, I mentioned earlier refer to as eye poems. And I thought these were beautiful, but I honestly didn't know what to do with them at first. <laughs> and I remember presenting them in one of my thesis seminars and kind of getting some blank stares. Um, but in, in the end, I began to see them as uh, methods of identifying the work of staying at home. You could really hear it in the voice of the individual and you could hear about their planning and uncertainty and, and a demonstration of what did or didn't get done. It also helped me to avoid slipping into themes, which I didn't want to do. Um, and while there are common occurrences across accounts, uh, these were used to pinpoint textual coordinated coordination. So for example, where the Home and Community Care Services Act of 1994 was influencing um, some, um, something, some experience, um, uh, it allowed me to sort of trace that rather than create a theme called home care, which was really, it would, would have been an abstraction of their experience. So here's an example. Uh, this is Elizabeth, who's an older adult who is in the grouping of individuals um, be, that I've called before help is needed. And she lives alone. And when we first began speaking, she talked about, she talked like this. I do drive. I'm able to do some things. I have to ration myself. I get very tired. I might just do one errand a day. I come home. I'm usually on the computer trying to fix problems in the afternoon. I do that myself. Later in our discussion, she says, I go by myself. I don't have anybody to come with me. I was supposed to have surgery. I've got skin cancer. I couldn't find anybody to take me. I canceled it. I still don't know how I'm going to get somebody to take me. I don't know who to talk to. I don't know how to find out that information. I don't know what help I need. I don't know where to get it. And so when I sort of looked at this, I was struck by in the first instance, we have a very capable and resourceful person who spends her afternoon solving problems. And so what's happening in our system that she gets to the place where she feels she doesn't know. And, and you know, and I looked at this experience of having been received a cancer diagnosis. How is it that a person, an older person who receives a cancer diagnosis isn't asked if they have anybody that could help them get to surgery? So you know, it starts to raise questions about how things are organized that create this experience. In the second, and I had three groupings. So the second grouping is the group of people that were accessing help at home. The individual that they're caring for has, uh, they've made an application to long-term care and they're waiting. And so they're living at home. And Dolores is a care partner. And she says, I needed to have physical stamina to lift him. I was up to him three and four times a night. She goes on to say, I even tried to get respite care in the evening for a meeting. I booked it close to four weeks ahead. I didn't hear back, didn't hear back. I called at nine o'clock, no one was there. I called again, do I get dressed? Don't I get dressed? I didn't always know they were gonna be late. I think that's the one thing I was really challenged with. And then we, as our conversation goes on, she says, I got to the point, I just accepted that this was the next stage in the metamorphosis. I was now a full-time caregiver. I had to relinquish some of the things that I thought were important to who I was and try to figure out other things. And so I could really hear in, in the course of our conversation how, uh, how much work she was doing to support uh, her, her spouse uh, and what that cost her in terms of herself and what she gave up. And finally, I come to, to Roberta. R Roberta was living in long-term care. And we started out the conversation. One of the questions I ask is sort of, how did you come? Uh, what was your everyday like? And how did you come to be there? Uh, and so she was saying, I was living on the lake. I could ride up and down on the stair lift. I had plants. I had the big bedroom. It had the little bathroom. I usually have to go several times a night. I could just feel my way across the room. And Roberta was living with blindness. Uh, later on, she says, I got along fine. I was on my own. I managed quite well. I had a small freezer. I could just put the meals on wheels in the microwave. I used a fair amount of canned food. 
I did make soups. And later she, she recounts um, the instances around her move to long-term care. I got the call the day before. I would be moved as soon as there was room for me. I, can't, I couldn't see to cook. I was moved. I was moved. And what, I, what struck me here is earlier she was recounting how she manages her meals. And then as she's recounting being called and told that she's going to move to long-term care, it's as if she's recounting the words that are said to her when she says she can't cook, because in fact she can. Um, and so that sort of uh, was something I found interesting um, and, and wanted to look at more. This is the way I handled some of the uh, information. So I would isolate these instances of participant experience and then really examine them and think about what texts might actually be creating those conditions. And so I, I ended up with long lists across all my participants of they would say something and then I would I would recognize, you know, uh, that there was some sort of text that was associated with that and that would lead me to further further tracing. So this is a bit of an eyeful. You don't have to, you know, try to memorize it all. I just to show you, you know, how how detailed. Uh, so when this particular participant talks about the two hundred and fifty dollars for an ambulance and the cost and not having that kind of money, I wondered, well, why did they have to pay? And part of the reason why they have to pay is because what this person needed an ambulance for, which was just to transport her 101 year old mother for dental surgery in hospital, uh, that would have been deemed medically unnecessary. And so she would have been levied a charge. And so those implications were interesting. Uh, this is a bit of imperfect tracing. So one of the concepts in institutional ethnography is to draw maps of of uh, from that sort of trace back from the person's experience into the actors and the coordinating texts that create those conditions so that you can sort of illuminate those mechanisms of coordination. And I tried to use sort of a business tool here, which I'm familiar with, which is called a, a fishbone diagram to kind of create this cause and effect. Uh, I'm showing it to you. It's not, it's, if you're, if you're com coming to this with knowledge of institutional ethnography, you'll spot the errors right away. And um, the errors here are that um, uh, I actually have disconnected the text and the actors. So I will be doing another version of my drawings, but this is what I had come to uh, for, for the, in the first instance. And I wanted to walk this through for you. Um, so let's go back to the laundry for a moment. Sounds like it's, uh, it's sort of this mundane, unimportant thing, but let's talk about the implications of the laundry. Uh, when this participant says they couldn't do my laundry, they could do his laundry. And the material consequences of, of that are uh, that she had to leave, in order to do her own laundry, she had to leave her husband unsupervised. And he requires constant supervision. He's a high risk of fall. She stays in the room with him most of the day, or he's in, in her visual field, field of vision most of the day. And so it was no real respite for somebody to come and just do his laundry. And if you can imagine a, an older couple living alone, how much laundry is in the laundry basket and how big is the machine? Like what, you know, from my, my perspective is, well, just take the whole basket. But instead, <laughs> instead, there was this division of laundry. And so, you know, what causes that? Well, this is sort of um, caught up in the, the service text, the, the service requests, how they're written, how the personal support worker is instructed and trained. And uh, I'll just draw your attention right in the middle at the bottom is, is um, personal support and homemaking services schedule three. And there's some specific language we're gonna come back to in a moment that, that could be contributing here. Let's take another look at another one. This is Roberta and she is the, the individual who moved to long-term care uh, when her husband moved and they had told her um, as soon as a, a room, you'll be, as soon as there's a room, you'll be moved. And so here's the, the various um, actors and coordinating texts that create those conditions. Um, again, we, you can see on the far left-hand side, the presence of the Home and Community Care Services Act 1994. And what's interesting about that, it was repealed in October, 2021, uh, but it still continues to coordinate the home care experience while new home care regulations are being drafted. So um, what we see in that text still, still coordinating people's experiences. And right in the center here is um, uh, an interesting policy called the, uh, it's, it's a policy around the prioritization for long-term care admission. And one of the um, uh, priority reasons for long-term care admission is called spousal reunification. 
So let's take a little closer look at that. The, the material consequences for Roberta were that she was leaving a home in which everything in, the, in this little house was fine. And she also took up the belief that it wasn't safe for her to be living at home because she was blind and she was older. Really though, she'd been living with blindness for 15 years. She was receiving uh, meals and housekeeping and support from neighbors. And in fact, she was actually called by her neighbors from time to time to help them. Uh, her husband had been hospitalized for four months uh, before he was transferred to long-term care. So she was actually living alone. And um, she was advised that she would be moved as soon as there was room and she did move but she didn't wanna share a room with her husband. So she didn't move into the same room as him. So interesting. And her day, when I spoke to her about what she, what she did in her day to day in long-term care, she got up, she dressed herself. Um, she, you know, she worried about her clothes matching because she, she uh, uh, couldn't see, but she managed. Uh, she made her own bed and she took herself down to, to breakfast. And then she would come outside and sit out on the deck um, and when I saw her, that's where we had our interview. And so she was pretty self-sufficient in the long-term care environment, which sort of begs the question, did she really need to be there? So um, one thing we know, uh, as I mentioned, that there is a policy that kind of may have created the conditions that uh, would have uh, led a care coordinator to suggest that she should move. And it's intended really, um, it's, it's, it's intended for when two spouses are seeking admission to long-term care or they're already in two separate homes. And we really wanna prioritize give, bringing people back together. And there was a whole, when this policy was being crafted, there was a whole um, concern about older people being separated and living in separate long-term care homes. A lot of stuff in the papers at the time. The Auditor General noted in 2012, almost all cases they reviewed at the CCAC that they visited indicated at least some alternatives to a, to a long-term care home were investigated. However, satisfaction surveys conducted by those CCACs indicated that between 30 and 44% of, 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 the, of those uh, clients did not feel that they were informed of all the available alternatives. And interestingly, Roberta was not receiving home care. In 2020, the Canadian Institute for Health Information reported that one in nine new long-term care residents potentially could have been cared for at home. And so I started to ask the question, were there some assumptions made about Roberta because of her age and blindness? And was this policy sort of applied to her situation without sort of offering other options? I'll just uh, skip ahead to the literature review. I've mentioned already that I relied on Dahmer for that. And, and, and what she did differently in the literature review was she looked at not just the contents of the articles, but she also looked at how the articles related to one another. And she traced lineages of references and citations. So you could start to see how earlier references are used repeatedly uh, in later articles and influence later articles. And that work inspired me to look for specific texts that were referenced in articles. So when I was looking in the aging in place uh, literature, I was also interested in policy documents and legislation in different countries that might have enabled um, some of those options to be made available. Uh, this also, I used this to inform that social context uh, part of the listening guide. And so I looked at aging in place literature, seniors health policy literature and literature legislation in uh, Ontario. And what I noticed is um, in the aging in place literature, and I, I had done a, I did a scoping review looking at over 700 abstracts and titles, and then looking more in greater detail at 70 full text um, articles. And there are about 31 enablers for aging in place that kind of are repeated in that literature. In the policy documents, a lot less has been recommended. So the full scope of possibilities begins to narrow as we get we start to develop policy advice. And by the time we get to legislation, which I've called what has been done, uh, and I looked at um, the legislation for the last 20 years, we've winnowed even more and we're down to fewer options that, um, that are then driving older adult experience. So I'm just gonna move now to the discussion and I know we're, I'm uh, eating through my time here. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about these things, uh, the accounts of the work of aging in place, intertextuality and extra local coordination. And so um, I mentioned before that the iPoems helped me really sort of see the accounts that people were, were saying in terms of the work they were doing to remain aging in place. And in the first group, Elizabeth's group, 
uh, before help is needed. People were uh, identifying that they were uh, their work included energy conservation, so that self rationing, adapting, so changing their driving or their personal standards. Their gardens weren't the weeds weren't pulled to the extent that they might have been. They were working at securing help, um, and they were doing information work like solving problems. And Dahmer had also seen this in extensively in the work that she did. For the group that was accessing help at home, I really felt some intensity here. There was emotional work as well as um, physical work uh, with several participants identifying that they were actually taking fitness classes in order to do the physical work. And for the group that was leaving home, they were needing to move, they were giving things up, they were getting used to new people that they had to live with. And they were also concerned about paying the bills. Um, Roberta remarked that she and her husband had budgeted to live until they were 92. And when they met her, she was 93. And she was worried about how she was going to have to be able to continue to afford to remain in the home that she was living. They were also resisting. Sandra, um, and all of these are pseudonyms, uh, Sandra had identified that um, she had been scolded uh, by the operators of the retirement home she lived in for feeding the animals that came up from the ravine. So she told me she just waited until dark and then she went out and put the food out there for them anyway. Please don't tell anybody. <laughs> I also explored this concept of intertextuality, which I came to understand is how text um, work uh, on each other, inform each other and are taken up in other kinds of texts. And so starting and, and tracing upwards from the Home and Community Care Services Act, there's regulations, there's the client uh, services policy manual, there's personal uh, and uh, there's the personal support and homemaking services and care plans and service were at requests were less obvious. But there is a form for service requests that I could locate but care plans I was not able to see directly. Um, what I did notice was there was a bit of a discursive shift in language in the earlier documents, the language being used to describe the individuals uh, that were receiving home care, they were called people, they were persons. Uh, around 20, uh, 2018, the language of patients started to appear. And uh, some of the service request language is service recipient and client. And I thought that that might be interesting. And it took me to look a little more closely back to the laundry again for a moment. Uh, so, um, you know, in, in the regulation, it says that the person and must require personal support services along with the home homemaking services. And it occurred to me that language was potentially enabling enough to allow the doing of laundry of the people that require the services, which might have included Dolores. Um, when you get to the, the actual manual and the service schedule and the descriptions that are communicated then to the recipient agencies that then go and carry out the task, the language has shifted to patient and its activities related to patient's laundry. And that's a very individualized term. And you can see why the personal support worker would be instructed to do his laundry and not necessarily hers. So these shifts um, raise some unanswered questions and, and are sort of signals of things to watch for. So let me move now to a few implications. So, you know, what I'm seeing so far, and this is where I feel, feel free, if you're seeing something different, um, pop it in the chat, I, I welcome your comments. Uh, but what I'm seeing is that our current legislation and policy constrains the options that are available um, to enable aging in place. So we've seen that winnowing effect from all the possibilities to where legislation has focused its, its attempt or legislation has been focused. Of the 31 possible enablers, uh, health and social services and, and social supports are most frequently referenced. And I've spent a lot of time talking about those. The work involved in aging in place is considerable and it is coordinated by multiple hierarchies of text. You know, in some cases there were 19 different statutes or policies that were coordinating a person who, um, uh, who was trying to live at home. And they are activated simultaneously or independently. And really what I came away with was that this assembly of texts demonstrates that there is no system of older persons care in Ontario. And that was really um, consistent with people's, uh, the participants experiences of lack of coordination. Some other implications that I, I wanted just to point out are, you know, there are up to now some unexplained discursive shifts in language in the coordinating text. And I only mean up to now uh, in that I have not yet found an explanation for the, 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 the discursive shifts. So, you know, this change from person to patient 
Um, and in my work, my everyday work, this change from person to bed, we talk about beds, we don't talk about people. We talk about ALC, we don't talk about person. And uh, ALC means alternate level of care, a term that's used to categorize people who remain in hospital after the acute phase of their illness. And I think this can be further investigated. Some of the textually mediated actions, um, and this was some of the language that was expressed to me uh, through Roberta's experience, you know, you can't stay there, you'll be moved. They highlight to me some uh, taken for granted assumptions about older people and, and potentially ageism, even benign ageism. And they impact the experiences and the expectations of older people. Roberta took up that language. I didn't argue, I couldn't, I couldn't cook. Um, this learning is already influencing responses to the development of, of new regulations for home and community care in Ontario because I am a health leader and I've taken up these tools into my professional life and that's part of what I do in my work. So let me just sort of go to the strengths and limitations. I think this work adds to analytic approaches used in institutional ethnography. If you are an institutional ethnographer, I'd love to hear your critique or comment. Um, as well, I think this study, it, it definitely involves participants of advanced age who live with complex health conditions who are not often included in research. And it expands scholarship and aging in place by helping to explicate how it does and does not occur. The limitations are that the participants were almost all women and they had some means to support themselves. So the experiences of homeless or other marginalized individuals is not, in, is not reflected in these experiences and uh, certainly uh, should be further examined. It wasn't possible to locate all the texts suggested. And so I may have closed off important tracings. Uh, as well, I didn't interview actors responsible for activating the text. It was often difficult to locate them because the participants did not have their names. Um, so I relied on extensive, my extensive experience having been working in the system in different capacities, but I could have introduced some assumptions about the way texts were activated in doing that. Um, I think the contribution here is that I've identified numerous institutional processes and examples. I've modeled the application of these kinds of research to, tools by a health leader. And I've uh, done a, this scoping review of aging in place literature using an IAE informed approach that I think that can be helpful to inform future policy direction. And really, so in conclusion, the current health system design does have some opportunities to gather the experiences of patients. Uh, and I give some example, patient and family advisory committees and people, and um, my own organization has an older adult and care partner advisory council. Um, but living with advanced age and the busyness of care partners of such individuals means that direct conversations with older people are not always possible. And so the ability to use stories is still relevant, but they need to be treated uh, in a particular way. The increasing use of frailty as a conceptual frame for planning requires some caution. It could contribute to structural ageism. And I would say that tools to support listening can help identify important coordinating texts and actors and opportunities for meaningful change. So I would just wanna thank, there's a whole host of people to thank and I, no, I just won't let me thank, I'm just skipping over, ah, sorry. <laughs> Flipping around, there we go. Uh, Peter Sajak, Dr. Peter Sajak is my supervisor. Dr. Simon Adam and Dr. Linda Muzzin are my thesis committee members and some have joined me today. Um, my participants, some of whom along with my first supervisor, Dr. Bernie, uh, Dr. Bonnie Burstow are no longer with us. And friends and families and supporters, uh, the fact that I uh, contacted many of you at the last minute because I was feeling very nervous and wasn't sure I wanted to share and you showed up anyway, uh, means that I'm really truly blessed. So with great gratitude, I, I uh, leave it there and thank you so much. Great, thank you. That was fabulous, fascinating. And those eye poems, I've never seen them before, but they were wonderful. So um, really interesting. And there's so many people on uh, here that I think could uh, uh, add contributions as caregivers, as older adults, as academics, as practitioners. So I'd love to hear some of their comments. But just before I open the floor, I do wanna say that Susan Murphy did put a link in 
for evaluations. And it's really important. We really value that. And we'll pass that along to Kelly so that she can have some feedback uh, from you. Um, so thank you so much. And the floor is open. Please uh, add your questions or comments. You can put it in the chat or just unmute and, uh, and share. Heather, I saw you had a variety of comments. Did you want to pop in and say something? Oh, I was just reading to, um, you know, uh, Sabine's suggestion in terms of, uh, yeah, I, I just, um, it it was a very powerful to see the I statements all together. And I, and I think I can, I, I am a, I guess, clinician leader. So in the similar space as um, Kelly and a few people here on the call. So I can appreciate, uh, you know, the, uh, this tool of helping us hear things differently. So I, I really, um, I, I really valued the I poem. Thanks, Heather. Great. Um, Ifrat said, a really powerful talk. Wow. In terms of the long-term care disasters that have been happening through COVID, do you think this will shift any of the supports or coordination necessary to support aging in place? Well, that's what I hope. Uh, thank you for asking the question, Efrat. I appreciate it. Um, I certainly hope that. Um, I think uh, we we can really see that. And and as I sort of complete the legislative review piece, what I am struck by is where the legislation sits right now and where the policy direction is. And the policy direction is really focused around the building of long term care spaces. And that's not what older adults say they want. So I, I think we know this. Um, uh, and uh, you know, I'm hopeful that that being able to elevate the voices of, of older adults and influence design in small and large ways um, will be an outcome of some of this work. All right. So I see a hand up from Mosaic Home Care. Want to introduce uh, yourself? Yes, my name is uh, Jane Teasdale. I'm one of the co-owners of Mosaic. And uh, we've done a lot of uh, research and uh, developed processes on person-centered care, meaningful conversations and really understanding when doing assessments, what individuals are needing. And I think, um, you know, the, uh, you know, some of the hospitals have an integrated approach where they may have a, a geriatric doctor, social worker, and some other members of the team, that seems to work very well from the hospital and being discharged back home. I think it depends on the person who is doing the assessment um, and assessing uh, and, and speaking to uh, the clients. Um, they have to be knowledgeable about what supports are available in the community and to tap in to the social networks, which are community agencies and uh, community centers, uh, North York Senior Center, you know, just to name but a few. Um, because all those resources coming together, um, if a family is having, um, you know, care through public health, um, through the, the LINS or the Home and Community Support Services, that might not be enough. Then they're having to reach out to private organizations to provide that care that are doing integrated models and person-centered care and so forth and may have social workers on the team. Um, so I don't, There, it, it's still very gray area and um, you know, you're really having to understand what the client's needs are and if they are able to stay in their homes, I mean, you know, some of them do have to go to long term care. And even those that are going into long term care are still not getting the help that they need because then they're the families are calling for private family funded home care to come in to provide that one on one. Um, you know, in a lot of countries, they are looking at aging at home. Dr. Samir Sinha um, through Mount Sinai, he's done a lot of talks about that and how you know, at this time, we don't have the infrastructure in place to do it. And I think we need to get better at doing that and to not be working in silos. Um, you know, some of the issues from leaving from hospital, if a family has used a private home care agency, you know, they're not around the table upon discharge. When the family's been using family funded care, 
they should be part of that discussion upon discharge so things are working smoothly within the community. So there's a lot of things. Um, the, I think you had mentioned, Kelly, in your presentation is the social connection, um, relationship building, and that social, social networks within the community if people do stay at home. Are they connected to senior centers? So there's a whole area that needs to be looked at when people are staying at home to make sure they're tapping in. So yeah, thank you for that. You, you reinforced so, for me the, uh, the perspective that we don't really have a system. Uh, uh, so thank you for, for those comments. And I'm conscious that we're at full time, but I would draw your attention, Kelly, to lots of positive comments in the chats and lots of mention about how powerful it is. One person was saying that, uh, you know, how meaningful it is and, and really that these oh, those I poems should preface every policy paper and funding application. So really very powerful and wonderful work. And someone's going to also send you some um, citations on uh, poetic and creative forms of analysis. So Fabulous. thank you so thank much. You. Uh, maybe Susan can capture these for you so you can look at these subsequently. And please feel free to email Kelly any additional comments or points. We're so glad you came today. We have other... Um, Emerging Scholars uh, talks over the next uh, next three months. And if some of you are doctoral students just finishing up or postdocs would like to present to us this year or next, please contact us. So thank you so much. Fantastic, wonderful um, presentation and, and very eye-opening. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Stop recording. <sighs>